Hey YouTube, I'm TK, it says so right here, and it's Friday, not a Monday. Um, I actually have been putting off this video um, because I had a party on Monday night for my work and I'm incapable of planning ahead, um, but more importantly, our topic this week is dysphoria and transition, and that's a topic that I feel really vulnerable talking about. Um, you know, in thinking about it, conceptualizing it, felt fine. I've even had, like, in-person conversations about this number a number of times, and that just feels intrinsically different than uploading a video for anyone to see. So, uh, before we proceed, if you know me IRL or if you are family, uh, proceed with caution because I'm going to be discussing my junk a little bit. I will be sure to warn you so that you can skip ahead. So, our topic this week, dysphoria and transition. From what I understand, dysphoria can be categorized in two different ways. We have social dysphoria, and we have body dysphoria. Social dysphoria depends a lot on context. It's in how people refer to you, and how they see you and treat you, and in the expectations based on whatever social role you're presumed to be in. Sometimes, being in a space with people who see you for who you are, and respect your wishes in referring to you in the ways that you like to be referred to can go a long way in relieving social dysphoria. Body dysphoria, on the other hand, is an idea that is very saturated in the way cis people think about trans people. That something is wrong with your body. I think of it as a kind of dysphoria that happens in a vacuum. That is to say, even with no context, it's just you and your body there is still something about it that makes you uncomfortable or uneasy and just something that you can't really reconcile. And I think using those words is definitely understating it. However, I don't experience body dysphoria very much, so I don't want to talk about what I don't know. <clears throat> so moving into my social dysphoria, a lot of these times the two of them can interplay with each other. For me, I felt like I had no control over my body and about how people saw me, and I, to relieve that, I started binding. First, just as an experiment, but then I kept doing it because I liked how it looked and it gave me more control over my appearance, or so I thought. Because people kept misgendering me in spite of that. I didn't want to change my, I did not want to have to change my mannerisms in order to be read as something other than a woman. That just didn't feel right to me. I guess. I wanted to suppress some of the more feminine aspects of my appearance so that I could be seen the way that I wanted to without having to change my affect. So moving into transition a little bit, before I get into the ins and outs of my transition, this needs to be said. Transition does not have to include hormones, or surgery, or anything that you don't want it to include. You don't have to change your appearance, your presentation, not even your name and especially not to get people on board with your transition. You change what you want to change, and that's it. So, I said in the last video, in a previous video, that I work in a coffee shop. Um, I'm interacting with a lot of different people on a regular basis, and I was getting misgendered a lot by customers and by most of my coworkers. That was distressing. That's a textbook example of social dysphoria. So, I am really fortunate and grateful that I was able to transition at this job. Uh, I actually interviewed as a girl, and on the first day of training, uh, an opportunity arose for me to come out to my manager, so I did. Also, you get to see Vegas tail in this video. Thank you. Um, I told my manager I was genderqueer, and I tried to be as clear as possible about my pronouns to the rest of the staff. I was only using they, them at the time. And I had my friend who helped me get the job. He was the only one in my corner to set a good example to everyone else, and it was really hard, and I was still really unsure of myself. About three months later, I started hormones. I wanted my voice to change because it wasn't helping the way that I was being read at work. Uh, for some months prior, I did research about the effects of testosterone on people assigned female at birth, um, as anyone should before starting HRT. And now this is the point where I start talking about my junk. You can skip forward by about a minute and then I'll move on and then move on with the video. 
Um, so in doing that research about testosterone, uh, I learned about growth downstairs. I didn't know anything like that was possible, and I really latched onto the idea. Looking back, I can even pinpoint instances of what I would now call genital dysphoria. At the time, <sighs> there you go. I don't know if you heard him meow. <sighs> so, at the time, I thought it was just like stress or just any combination of other factors, but it was like my libido was not matching up with the way I wanted my genitals to respond. My stuff was just like offline, not responding, and that was really distressing for me. So when I learned that on T, my stuff would try its hardest to grow larger, I decided that that's what I wanted. There was even a time where I did a lot of research into bottom surgery options, but I decided it wasn't right for me and I'm honestly happy with what I've got going on right now. If I had all the resources ever, you know, I might pursue a motoidioplasty. You can Google that if you're really interested. Um, but that's not very high on my priority list because I know I might have to get a hysterectomy eventually. Not looking forward to it. All right, so junk talk over. Back to other stuff that's a little more kosher. That's not the right word. Anyway, while we're on the topic of surgery, I had top surgery uh, 10 months ago. You're going to get to see the results. Um, I went to Dr. Garamoni in Fort Lauderdale, and it was a great experience. Um, let me scoot down a little bit so you can see the scars. They're looking really good. Um, so in a vacuum, I was totally fine with my boobs. They were just sort of there. They didn't explicitly bother me. Um, that's very different from how I felt going through puberty, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so I was totally fine, except for when the social dysphoria started to kick in. I knew that my boobs were what were making people read me as a woman. And I realized, yeah, I'm fine with my boobs as long as I don't have to leave my house. That's a problem. And I hated binding a lot. I liked how it looked. I hated the way it made me feel. It's painful. It hurts your back. It's just uncomfy. You can, if you're not careful, you can even like break a rib and mm -mm. it sucks. It's something, something people have to do sometimes. So I couldn't imagine going through another summer of binding, much less another year. And I saved what I could, got some help from my parents, and again, I am extremely fortunate that my wife, Lucy, had a well-paying job and a good amount of savings. So that trip to Fort Lauderdale was also when I realized that it was even remotely possible for me to be read as a guy. The staff at Dr. Garamoni's office just he, him, his automatically, and I got this like boost of confidence. I remember going out to eat after I got my drains taken out. They put them in here and here you get to keep them in for five days it's super gross but then it's over <laughs> but anyway after I got my drains taken out I remember going out to eat and thinking like is this how I get to feel now like okay being in public again okay going to the bathroom just like just getting to be you know uh, I had never used the men's restroom before I always just felt really weird doing it and I had always just tried to find neutral bathrooms wherever I could, but, you know, but that experience just kind of, everything clicked, and I was like, maybe, you know, this, this is, this feels good. So, the main factors in my decision to medically transition were so that I could feel more comfortable moving about in the world, and also a big thing was that misgendering so that misgendering wouldn't derail my whole day at work when it would happen I would just go hide in the back you know and just try to push it off but it, it would be like lingering and I, it was just bad and then when a coworker did it it was really stressful and I would stress like how do I tell them is it worth telling them like you know I even I even upset somebody I used to work with over me confronting her about this it was just it was just awful I don't, you know, um, so yeah, I learned how to trust my judgment, and I figured that after doing all this, I'd be able to bounce back more effectively from misgendering, 
I could just look at myself and be like, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, whatever. It's evident to me. Uh, before, knowing that people were just wrong, it wasn't enough for me. Um, you know, it, in fact, I got misgendered at work last night. It's a thing that happens. I was able to laugh it off. And, you know, just, I could just, ha, you're wrong, move on. I didn't even say anything to the guy. It just happened, got him his stuff, went on with my day. My night, really. Um, and so... I've accepted that there are people who are going to misgender me. There are regulars at the coffee shop, people who I greet by name, who still think I'm a girl. And, you know, maybe I'll address it one day, but in the meantime, like, I can't really do anything about it because I'm getting them their coffee, you know. I can't be like, hey, I'm a dude, by the way. Um, maybe I'll find the time. You know, but, but, that's, but that right there is... You know, that I can do that and that it's not something that's just like weighing on me. Like that's, that's why I did this. I, you know, I, I can deal. And you know, when people at work, when customers do it, I figure, you know, they're caffeine deprived. They can't help it. They're oblivious, you know. <laughs> that's what I'm here for, to get you the caffeine that you need. And so, you know, it's a, strangers are just going to misgender me because my face is still kind of feminine, but I like my face. You know, and I'm fine with that. I have no hope of being stealth in any kind of professional capacity. Stealth, another thing that we can talk about another time. Um, but I have no hope of being that in any kind of professional capacity because I went to a women's college. The top line of my resume gives me away in every job interview. I have to be upfront about it. Um, and so I was right about what I thought. You know, my transition is pretty much over and I'm comfortable and happy and I get to just live and do other stuff now. And that's great. So I think that's everything that I can think of to say on the topic of dysphoria and transition, at least from my point of view. I try to throw in a couple of other things that are important and need to be said. Um, and if you liked what you see, if you learned something, consider subscribing. Check out all the other amazing videos from our other contributors. They're wonderful, beautiful, smart people who are worth your time. And that wasn't as scary as I thought. I'm on the other side of it now, and I can move on with my day. So thanks for your time, and I'll see you next week. Probably on a Monday this time.